Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Sundays with Tim. I'm Catherine Haight, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the Mount Wilson Institute. As you know, the Mount Wilson Institute is the caretaker organization for the historic Mount Wilson Observatory, sitting atop the mountains above Pasadena. Sundays with Tim is part of the Mount Wilson Institute's 2021 summer program called Discovering Mount Wilson. Discovering Mount Wilson is our campaign across many social media platforms to showcase the amazing history of the observatory. Whether you follow Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, our website, or our newsletters, you'll be able to find wonderful stories about Mount Wilson this summer. Our featured speaker tonight, of course, is Tim Thompson. Tim is with us today from the beautiful Hale Library on the Carnegie Observatory's campus on Santa Barbara Street in Pasadena. Tim is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Mount Wilson Institute and is one of the foremost authorities about Mount Wilson. This is a busy weekend for Tim because he spoke last night as part of our lecture series in the Mount Wilson Auditorium. To find out more about our lecture series up on the mountain, please see our schedule at the website at mountwilson.edu, and that's mtwilson.edu, mtwilson.edu. And I'll note if ever any of you get a chance to have Tim as a docent on a daytime tour or a session director on a public or private viewing session, take it. <laughs> it's like having your own private historian for a few hours. Actually, all of our docents and session directors are super knowledgeable about Mount Wilson's history. And I'll take a second to mention to all of you, think about setting up a private tour for you and your family or friends or a business group or whomever in the observatory domes. Um, we have them in both the 60 inch and the 100 inch. It's an absolutely magical night. And uh, you, you will never forget it. Your guests will never forget it. And you can find out more about that at, at mountwilson.edu, mtwilson.edu. So tonight, Tim will be talking about the research that was done on Mount Wilson in the historical context of World War I. And I'm, for one, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, Tim will also explain in detail the famous glass plate that showed that there is more, much more to the universe than just the Milky Way galaxy. This is the plate on which you can really see Hubble's surprise at seeing a variable star. If you have questions, that, uh, please put them in the chat during the presentation and Tim can address them at the end. And with that, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Boy, <clears throat> well, let me uh, share my screen here and fire it up. <clears throat> well, I'm, if you recall the last time I did one of these, I told the story of the two 60s, the 60 inch and the 60 foot tower. This time I'm going to tell the story of the 100 inch telescope, the noblest weapon ever made by man. And I will explain what I mean by that in, in a few minutes. <clears throat> but let me start by reminding you that while the 60 inch came before the 100 inch you will notice that the blank disc for the mirror of the 100 inch telescope arrived here where i am in santa barbara street in pasadena on the 7th of december 1908 on the very same day that the finished product 60 inch mirror was being mounted in its telescope so you may recall from my uh, earlier talks that before George Hale had his hands on the 40 inch refractor at Yerkes Observatory, he was already working on the 60 inch telescope. And now you see that before he had his hands on the 60 inch telescope, he was already working on the 100 inch telescope, just plowing away. <clears throat> so these two telescopes, the 60 inch and the 100 inch together, create the legacy out of which every large telescope ever made in the history of astronomy since then uh, survives. So this, this, these two are the telescopes that were the proof of concept 
demonstrated that you could make a super large telescope, make it work, do astronomy with one. And now we've got telescopes in space and enormous telescopes on the ground. They're building even more enormous ones now, all because of George Hale and Mount Wilson. <clears throat> and speaking of the mirror, here it is. The 60 inch mirror and the 100 inch mirror were both made at Sangerban Glassworks in France. And both of them were the largest pieces of glass ever made by anybody for any reason. But one of George Hale's habits is to force every technology he encounters to break. And since the 60 inch telescope mirror failed to do that, he immediately went for a 100 inch mirror and was successful in breaking the mirror making technology. The largest glassworks in the world tried eight times to make a glass disc for the 100 inch mirror. Uh, attempt number three survived, and that's what you see here. <clears throat> All the other seven attempts failed. And by 1910, they just gave up you know, over in France and said, the one you've got is the one you're stuck with. You can see the side view. The ladle at the glass works was not big enough to pour all the glass at once. It had to pour the glass three times. That means three layers of glass, two layers of bubbles. You can clearly see the separations between the three layers of glass. And of course, it was hot glass, so the bubbles are trapped between layers of glass. Gas is trying to outgas air trapped in the molten glass. <clears throat> As a result, the glass disk is full of bubbles. And George Ritchie, who did the 60-inch telescope, um, just rejected it entirely, and so did Hale. But after they gave up, this is what they were stuck with it. So complaining all the way from about what a horrible fate he had to try to make a telescope mirror out of this, uh, George Ritchie proceeded to make a perfect telescope mirror. They were afraid the glass would come apart at the seams, literally, due to the thermal expansion and contraction, but it didn't. And they were afraid the bubbles would be exposed when they tried to make a parabolic surface, but that didn't happen either. Turns out it all worked great and it's in the telescope now. And if you get an observing session on the 100 inch telescope, you can look at light that bounces off this very mirror. Well, speaking of the mirror, here it is going up the mountain. It's in the truck at the end of the line. This is 1917, so I'll remind you, they don't have trucks like we do now, and they do have to stop every once in a while, pour stuff in the radiator and, and relax, and that's what they're doing. This is July 1st, 1917. In April of 1917, the United States declared war against Germany in World War I, and by July of 1917, already a large chunk of the American Expeditionary Force was in Europe. And of course, Europe had been fighting since 1914. So everybody had war on their mind for a long time. The Americans, of course, were seized with patriotic fervor because we're going to go over to Europe and show them how to do stuff. So while they're fighting, meanwhile, we're making the largest telescope in the world. <clears throat> this is a picture of the logbook entry for first light on the night of November 1st and 2nd. 1917, written by Wendell Hogue, the night assistant, and it lists everybody who was there. And there are the famous people. There's Hale and Adams, um, Arthur Joy, and a whole bunch of people whose names you would never recognize, the electrician, the carpenter, the people who worked on the telescope. They're not famous. You'll never hear about them. But they were there, so they could look through the telescope, too, because they worked on it. Only one person was not a staff member or somebody who worked on the telescope. The one outside guest was an English poet named Alfred Noyes. Now Noyes had married an American woman, daughter of a Civil War veteran, and he came to America on lecture tours and in fact in 1914 accepted a visiting professor position at Princeton University. So he was touring the country every year on lectures and teaching at Princeton. He was in California. Hale, who was also a man of letters, not just a scientist. He was familiar with literature and poetry and history and all that. He knew Noyes was in California. Noyes was already a world famous poet. So he invited Noyes to come up and look through the telescope on the night of first light so they could have 
the artistic, the poet's view of what's happening. Now, Noyes had been working on his mind for a long time on a poetic history of science, something which he called the torchbearers. But he just couldn't find the right motivation. He couldn't convince himself that I uh, should start it. Uh, but for a first light event, in his later notes, he pointed out this is what gave him the inspiration. Now he was ready to do it. He needed, he got the feelings, he got the impressions he needed to go to work on it. And so he did. And so here's Alfred Noyes, and here's a cover of his first book in the trilogy, Watchers of the Sky, just published in 1922. This was the part of the trilogy on the torchbearers, the history of the foundations of science that dealt with astronomy. And he had poems about uh, Kepler and Galileo and Tycho. But in the prologue, he writes about the impression he got the night he was at the 100-inch telescope. And of course, Noyes was also working for the English government, writing uh, poems about the glory of English history, and, and he was working on the war effort for England as well. So everybody had war on their mind at that time. And so he writes in the prologue about the 100-inch telescope. High in heaven it shone, alive with all the thoughts and hopes and dreams of man's adventurous mind. Up there I knew the explorers of the sky, the pioneers of science, now made ready to attack that darkness once again and win new worlds. Tomorrow night they hope to crown the toil of 20 years and turn upon the sky the noblest weapon ever made by man. <clears throat> so this is his reference to the fact that while the rest of the world is at war, the United States is busy building the world's largest telescope and advancing science for everyone. And that's where I got my noblest weapon ever made by man title. So now you know that the, the 100 inch telescope is a glorious instrument, <laughs> but remember that the instruments don't make the discoveries people do using the instrument. And the man of the hour uh, for this is Edwin Hubble. <clears throat> and so here's a picture of Hubble pointing to a picture of a picture. <clears throat> the image you see on the right is the glass plate. Remember that they did photography at Mount Wilson with glass plates that have a photographic emulsion on them. At the time, there was an argument uh, amongst astronomers as to whether or not what they called the spiral nebula were nearby or far away. And the nearby camp and the faraway camp, they both had reasons to, uh, to think the way they did. But the far away people said that, and correctly, that nova are preferentially clustered in the spiral nebula. That's where they go off. And they all look really dim, but we know nova are really bright, and therefore they must be far away because in order for a bright thing to look dim, it's got to be far away. So Hubble, to test this out, started looking for nova. And he was looking for nova in these things, especially M31, the big spiral nebula, the dominant one in the sky. Naturally, everybody looked at it. He was looking for nova. And you'll see I'll move my cursor over here, if it works, there we go. You see there's an N and there's a nova over here. And there's another one over here. And up here in the corner, two little black lines, there's a dot in there with an N. He was searching for nova. But nova are one-time affairs. They don't come back. It's some rare exceptions, but we don't need to worry about that now. They don't come back. But this one up here did. It came back and went away and came back and went away. It came back and went away periodically. And Hubble realized that he was not seeing a nova, but he was seeing a variable star. And he freaked out a variable star. Now he knew that he could do what Shapley did in discovering the Milky Way galaxy, which I discussed before. And so he got out his big red pen and wrote VAR on this, which is why everybody calls it the VAR plate. It's the one and only example of Hubble showing some real emotion regarding his scientific work. 
uh, in, in the written record, at least everywhere else, he's just good old Hubble. But here, he really went bananas. <clears throat> and for good reason, because he was able to use that and a whole bunch of other variables he saw to compute distances to this galaxy and several others. Uh, over on the left are the titles of the papers <clears throat> and the distances. These distances on the left are the ones Hubble gave in his paper. Uh, we, and the distances in parentheses are the ones we know now. And so now we know that Hubble seriously underestimated the distances to all these things. But that's a theme that runs throughout the entire history of astronomy. Whenever you find out how far away something really is, it's a lot farther away than you thought it was no matter what you thought, it always works that way. <clears throat> but even the distances that Hubble quotes here, 697,000 for NGC 6822, 896,000 for M31, were enormous distances, way beyond anything anybody ever talked about, anything anybody ever thought about. After the work of Shapley, they were all convinced the Milky Way galaxy was the whole universe, that's all there was to it, it was this little thing. And now all of a sudden, there's a great big universe out there. <clears throat> so when you saw in the intro that Mount Wilson Observatory is where we discovered our place in the universe, it's actually more than that. It's not just where we discovered our place in the universe. It's where we discovered the universe to have a place in to begin with, because nobody knew that there was one uh, like this. <clears throat> so after discovering the universe, Hubble also discovered that it was doing something. It was uh, expanding, at least that's the way most people look at it. Hubble himself never believed that at any time. He always denied the universe was expanding or just never believed it. <clears throat> but here is a picture of the plot from his paper, which shows you distance in parsecs along the horizontal axis and the redshift of the spectrum uh, written down as a Doppler velocity on vertical and a line through the scattered points. And contrary to what many people believe, this is not something he did in collaboration with Milton Hummison. He went to work with Hummison after this. The data that he's plotted here were data that were taken by Vesto Schlieffer at Lowell Observatory. He's the one who discovered the redshifts of the spiral nebula. But Hubble forgot to mention that he was publishing somebody else's data. In today's world, that would probably get you fired no matter who you were. And Hubble was able to survive, but he had to apologize a few times for doing that. <clears throat> Whoops, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> so he discovered the universe, he discovered it was doing something, but there are other things that were done with the 100 inch telescope not just Hubble discovering the universe, although that's probably the biggest thing. If you can remember back to my talk about the 60 inch telescope and why Hale wanted the reflector instead of a refractor, he wanted to do infrared astronomy and you can't do it with a refractor because the lens is opaque to most infrared. So one of his reasons was to do infrared astronomy and he set up the world's first consistent persistent program in infrared astronomy that was carried out by Seth Nicholson and Edison Pettit on the 100 inch telescope. They did infrared observations of stars and measured the temperatures of the planets, measured the temperature of the moon during a, during a lunar, lunar eclipse, not a lunar eclipse, a lunar eclipse. <clears throat> and this was the beginnings of infrared astronomy. After World War II, the first all sky infrared survey was made from Mount Wilson, the first discovery of an embedded protostar. And because of the infrared astronomy work that was Hale's original intention, infrared astronomy took off and is now a key cutting edge dominant topic in astronomy. And it all began at Mount Wilson Observatory. <clears throat> and another chunk of modern science began at Mount Wilson Observatory was interferometry. And here is the 20 foot interferometer attached to the 100 inch telescope. <clears throat> the beam that you see in this top picture has mirrors on it that move back and forth along the mirror. The diagram up here in the corner is an optical diagram shows the light from these mirrors 
is combined and comes out to the North Cassegrain uh, position where you can see it. The astronomer by cleverly examining the wave interference pattern of the light from these uh, mirrors can tune the mirrors until they correlate with the angular size of whatever you're looking at. And with that, we're able for the very first time ever to measure the angular size of stars. The obvious first target is Betelgeuse, which everybody knew was a red supergiant star and had to be very big, and indeed it is. And in fact, with the Hubble Space Telescope, named after Edwin Hubble, you can actually see the disk of Betelgeuse. And it's the only star that any single mirror telescope can do that with. They measured its diameter. And here you see it's 0 0.047 arc seconds, which is correct. There's no need to fix it. It's the same thing we'd measure today. They did that right. But they had a parallax angle and assumed they knew a distance. And they decided Betelgeuse is 240 million miles across, slightly less than the size of the orbit of Mars in our solar system. But while they got the angular diameter right, they were way off on the distance and seriously underestimated the distance to Betelgeuse, which is very much farther away than they thought it was. And now we know that Betelgeuse is not as big as the orbit of Mars in our solar system, it's as big as the orbit of Jupiter in our solar system. One star, it's super large. <clears throat> so naturally, having successfully created a technology for measuring the angular diameters of stars, it was necessary to break that technology because that's what George Elder Hale always does. He breaks every technology that he can find and forces the technologists to invent new ways of doing things. And so he built a 50 foot interferometer. Why not? If 20 works, 50 is even better. And if 50 worked, we'd build a hundred, why not? And so here's the 50 foot interferometer and there's Francis Pease looking through the eyepiece. But in this case, it was just too much to ask for. The measurements are so sensitive that they're too sensitive to the flexing of the steel beams. As the temperature changes, the steel may soften just the tiniest amount, flex just the tiniest amount more, nothing you would notice or care about if you were looking at it. But if you were doing interferometry with it, you'd notice it, care about it, and get it wrong because everything changed. And so the 50-foot interferometer was able to measure one or two angular diameters of stars, but really did not accomplish a whole lot and had to be shelled. And in fact, the building where this interferometer was set up is now the building that houses the office for our site supervisor. <clears throat> so we, the building was good. We kept the building. We just got rid of the interferometer because it doesn't work all that well. <clears throat> but remember, the man of the hour is Edwin Hubble. And here he is standing with other staff members of the observatory. Arthur King, standing next to Hubble, was the director of the physics laboratory for Mount Wilson. Remember that high on the list of Hale's things to do was astrophysics, especially the problem of stellar evolution, the physics of the sun, because George Ellery Hale always specialized in observing the sun. And so he built a physics laboratory with every observatory he made. And Arthur King was the laboratory physicist for decades at Mount Wilson. Alfred Joy is staff astronomer standing next to him. Charles St. John sitting in the chair on the left was a world famous solar astronomer who came to Mount Wilson every year to join Hale, do solar astronomy. Walter Adams was the director of the uh, Mount Wilson Observatory after Hale retired. Walter Meyer was the assistant, go-to guy, tour guide, what have you, and fellow physicist. For the guy sitting in front of Hubble, a German physicist, obscure character, not too many people have heard about, named Albert Einstein, <clears throat> who developed a theory called relativity, <clears throat> which describes the universe and uh, the law of gravity in a new way, separate from Isaac Newton. 
And when Albert Einstein developed his theory, he realized that the universe could not be static. It must be doing something like expanding. But everybody around him told him, sorry, the universe is not expanding. It's not doing anything too bad. So Albert diddled his equations to make the universe not expand. And then Hubble came along and made some observations and said, guess what? Well, Hubble didn't say because he didn't believe it, but everybody else said, hey, the universe is expanding and here it is. <clears throat> and so Einstein got mad at himself for not predicting it himself <clears throat> and undiddled his equations. And then he came to Mount Wilson Observatory on something of a pilgrimage, just like all the rest of us do so that he could see Edwin Hubble, see the 100-inch telescope, see where the observations were made, see how they were made. And he hung around Caltech for a while too, because Caltech is a famous place, why not? <clears throat> and so that's why Edwin Hubble is standing behind Albert Einstein in this picture. Einstein went there to see him and see his telescope. And Edwin Hubble was always there whenever any famous person came to Mount Wilson Observatory. It doesn't matter who it was, it could be a Hollywood actor and Edwin Hubble would be there because he's famous. And Edwin Hubble always wanted to be famous. From the time he was a small boy, he bound and determined to become famous. And he did as an astronomer. But you know, everyone has a secret life that you don't know about. <clears throat> So does Edwin Hubble. And I'm going to reveal that secret life to you here. You probably didn't know this, but now you're gonna walk away with some new secrets about Edwin Hubble. And that is that he was a basketball player and not just an ordinary basketball player. He was a hall of fame basketball player, specifically the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. When Hubble, he entered the University of Chicago as a freshman in 1906. He immediately got on the basketball team. And for the next three seasons, the University of Chicago basketball team won the Helms Foundation National Basketball Championship. And on his senior year, they couldn't quite make the national championship. They had to settle for a conference championship. And after Hubble left, he did not win another national championship or 10 years. After Hubble got out of the University of Chicago, he was a high school teacher for a few years. He taught Spanish and he was a basketball coach and coached several Indiana high school basketball teams to conference championships. And that's why he's in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. So if Hubble had not become famous as an astronomer, he might very well have become famous as a basketball player or maybe a basketball coach. He was going to become famous one way or another. And if he couldn't do it by astronomy, why not basketball? He obviously knew what he was doing. And here he is pictured with the University of Chicago basketball team looking every bit not like the famous astronomer, but like the famous basketball player. <clears throat> and with that, I will go back to the noblest weapon ever made by man. And I will, uh, I will let somebody feed me questions and I will do my best to make up uh, unbelievable answers. <laughs> so there you are. Thank you so much, Tim. It's so interesting about his basketball career. Is, are there any basketball hoops up on Mount Wilson? Did he ever play in his off time? Not that I know of. Uh, That's funny. Um, I love the description about the plate because I've, you know, that picture we've seen so many times and just, um, you know, to see the surprise is so interesting and to, how surprising it must have been to him to look for these novas and then see that. And um, it's just remarkable to catch, catch that on, on that plate. Amazing. Um, yeah, it was, I, of course, a surprise, but was also um, uh, a great discovery. And he knew it was a great discovery when he saw it because he knew what he could do with it. Yeah. That's why I said he freaked out. When he found it. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So we have a few questions from the audience. Um, I, first is just, what was Albert Einstein doing up there in January, 1931? How did that work? Did he get invited up? Did he say he wanted to come? What, what was the, how did that, how was that initiated? I don't know whether it was his idea or Hale's idea. 
it would be natural for Hale to invite him and it would be natural for him to ask to come. And of course, Albert Einstein got to go everywhere he wanted to go. And if he ever said, I would sure would like to visit, everybody would lay out the red carpet and, <laughs> and that would happen. He probably came to visit Caltech, but Mount Wilson is there as well. So, sure. so why not? Or maybe he came to visit Mount Wilson and went to Caltech, because why not? But I don't really know exactly Right. how the communication was done. In January 1931, it could have been really cold up there to be able to, did, did they actually look through the telescope those nights that he was up there? I don't know whether he actually looked through the telescope. He did look through solar telescopes. There are pictures okay, of him right. looking That's right, through. and going up the elevator I, there. Yeah, the eyepiece. Oh yes, but there's yeah. somewhere out there in the world is a movie of Einstein going up the elevator bucket to get to the top of the 150 yeah. foot tower. Now, we have very strict safety regulations today. Only two people in the bucket. We both have to wear uh, strap on safety seat belts that attach to the bucket and it's all. But back in the old days, you'd get half a dozen people standing on the top of the bucket and going up. Einstein was sitting on the bucket and the elevator bucket has an emergency brake. And you can see in the movie that both of Albert Einstein's hands are on the emergency brake all the way up and down his ride to the <laughs> elevator to the, the top of the 150 foot tower. So he was a smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> no safety equipment, but it looks like, and from some of those pictures that you needed a tie in jacket to get on, to be you able needed, to go up. You needed a tie in jacket to do everything back in those days, including hike up the mountains. That's amazing. Um, question from the audience. What steps did Hubble have to go through um, after finding and, and making, finding that, that plate and, and realizing what it meant to get the general science community to accept his theory that the Milky Way was only one of many, many you know, billions, millions of, of galaxies? Um, did he have publications? Did he speak at conferences? Um, how long did it take for that general recognition uh, to be accepted? He, he did speak at conferences, but he, Hubble, um, well, at first, of course, he didn't tell anybody because he only had one. So he needed to make a lot more plates, look for more variable stars, because each one you calculate a distance, but you're going to get a slightly different distance for each star. So you do a whole bunch of stars and you get an average. And when he had enough, then he, he wrote letters uh, to individuals and he, he did give at least one conference talk. I think it was 1924 or 25. He just published his first paper in 25. And I think he first kind of openly told people in 24, but he's, I can't remember the exact date. But he published his first paper in 25 and then 26, he published M33. It was 1929 when he published M31 and it was probably his publication of the paper in 1929 for M31 that really nailed everything down because NGC 6822, the object of his first paper is a nearby dwarf galaxy. And there were already some astronomers thinking, yeah, maybe it's just right outside the Milky Way. We, we, maybe it's not in. And so he published that one first and maybe he published that one first because he knew that and if nobody complained about the way he did things and they complained later, then he could say, well, wait a minute, you didn't complain when I published this one, what's your problem? And M33 was a small galaxy, but M31 was it's the great big dominant spiral that everybody looks at, everybody studies. And once you nail down M31, you just nail down everything because it's a huge galaxy. So I'm sure that by 1929, once he published M31, and he was a very well-known publisher, very, very well-known scientist, and everybody knew he was thorough and complete and careful scientist. Wow. And did he get a, a, a PhD in astronomy, physics? Do you know what his schooling was? His, yes, he went to the University of Chicago. Uh -huh. He got a PhD in astronomy. Um, Alan Sandage calls it one of the worst PhD theses he's ever seen. Um, and the reason is that Hubble was desperate to get into World War I. He was a major in the US Army and deployed to Europe, but I don't think he saw any combat. I don't remember exactly what his duties were. 
So he rushed his thesis. He just threw something together, threw it at the university, give me a PhD, and then ran off to Europe. Um, but he already had a deal with Hale, who knew him, mm -hmm. said, once you get your PhD, you can come here. Mm -hmm. And Hale's PhD, not Hale, Hubble's PhD topic, his specialty was photographing nebula, in this case, photographing spiral nebula. So, and that's what Hale wanted him to do. Hale wanted him to work on this problem of this spiral nebula. And so Hale didn't really care what the quality of his PhD thesis was because he already knew him and he knew that he wanted him to do the job. And so it was one of those things where you can get away with. And Sandage, of course, was Hubble's protege and graduate student himself and took over Hubble's position at Carnegie when Hubble passed away. So even though Sandage calls it a horrible PhD thesis, that everybody knew it was a horrible PhD thesis, nobody cared because they all knew what he was doing. But there you are. Yes. Um, another question, how do they decide, like in, in back in those days, who, who got to be on the telescope? Was it really just, you know, there was only one person who got priority or did they, you know, have a sign-up sheet in the kitchen or something? I mean, how did they figure that out? Oh no, Hale and Adams um, would decide who's, who's working on what research projects, what time they would get on the telescope. So they would schedule somebody would be in charge of the atoms or somebody would be in charge of scheduling and they would rotate. So Hubble would use the hundred inch. And then when Cap Tyne came to visit, maybe he would use the hundred inch to look for his star streams. And, uh, and in fact, um, whoever was assigned to the task of assigning people to work the telescopes, if they were a Democrat, they would make sure Republicans were always working on election day. And the Republicans did the same thing. To them. It was a well-known thing on the mountain that you would be working on election day if you were the opposite party from the guy doing the schedule, the standard operating procedure. And how does it work today at the big telescopes around the world? How do they decide? I mean, is each one different or is there kind of a general way that the decisions are made about who gets, which university gets to use a particular uh, telescope, something like that? Yeah. Every observatory has what's called a time allocation committee or TAC. And every observatory gets probably 10 times more applications for time than they have time available. They're hugely oversubscribed, all of them. And so they're fierce competition for time. And even people who have good research projects that you like to be able to do just can't get time because there isn't enough. These, yeah. these projects come ahead. And so there's pretty fierce competition uh, and, uh, and even good projects get left out, but, and it's tough. The, the time, alloc time allocation committee people are working and trying to they arguing with each other and this should come and this. <clears throat> so that's how it works everywhere. Okay, tough. Um... And question, was it unusual for outsiders, non-astronomers like noise to be invited up to certain events? Um, and do you know why, you know, was it, a, it was just that he was famous that he was invited up that particular time? Um, it is unusual for outsiders to be invited to an, an event like that. Um, Hale was, as I mentioned himself, a man of letters, uh, and he wanted an artist, some kind of artist to be there for that event. And he was fishing around for people. He, he knew already he wanted somebody to come up there and have an artistic viewpoint on this literary something. Noise was already very famous. He was already in California for his lecture tour and he was an obvious choice. And so Hale invited him to come up and of course noise came <clears throat> and as I mentioned, seeing the people, it, it's not just he was there looking through the telescope, but he was there for a couple of days at the observatory, at the monastery, he saw the astronomers, saw what everybody was doing. It was an experience, not just an event, but in, yeah. for an artist or a literary person, a poet, something like that, that kind of experience is what motivates you to now see something uh, that you were working on before. Like he was working on the torch bears, thinking about it, but he couldn't figure out a way to do it. And I then know. with this inspiration, now I know what to write. And then he went and wrote and in 1922, published Watchers of the Sky. 
you know, it's it's so interesting that Hale kind of set up that that legacy by having him up there because we're still doing that now by having the concerts in the dome, um, you know, quartets and other musical groups, some jazz. Um, he really kind of built that legacy, I guess, of, of really interconnecting art and science. And we're still doing that today. Happy to, to, to you know, know that we're doing that. And for uh, um, guests who want to come up, please, again, look at our website, mtwilson.edu, for the concerts. And there's nothing like listening to a, con a concert in the Dome. It's, it's really amazing. There so, are great connections between art and science. And my favorite connections are two textbooks I have on the physics of musical instruments, especially the physics of stringed instruments which is a thick book and it's a really interesting topic to find out how musical instruments actually physically work. Yes, and then also timing. And so it's, you know, there's just really a lot yeah. of math in music, um, yeah. but it just kind of looked at in a different way. Super, super interesting. We're gonna have to wrap it up right now. Um, Tim, thank you so much. And to everyone, we hope that you'll join us for our next Sundays with Tim on Sunday, September 26th at 5 p.m. Please mark your calendars. You can actually use the same link that you have for this presentation. Uh, now you can just cut and paste it and put it into your calendar for Sunday, September 26th at 5 p.m. We'd love to see you again. In the meantime, our next chapter of Discovering Mount Wilson will be posted on our social media platforms in two days, starting Tuesday morning, the 31st. Uh, so we'll see you all in September. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Good night. Thank you.